All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to your first session of DrupalCon Baltimore. Uh, I'm Josh Mulliken. This is Toby Hagler. Uh, we'll be talking about building a platform for MBA.com on Drupal 8. Um, the theme of the latest incarnation of MBA.com was and continues to be nothing between the fan and the game. And you'll see that theme repeated throughout the presentation. So for this morning's session, we're going to talk about four key areas that really help us meet this goal. First of all, it's important to note that NBA.com is more than just a desktop website. It's more than tablet and mobile. Uh, it needs to help support other devices, uh, PlayStation, Roku, Apple TV, smart TVs. Uh, it's, it's all about providing a very consistent digital experience for the fan. And content is king on NBA.com. We have to integrate live scoring data, editorial content, live video, edited down video clips, and of course the video is very, very crucial. It's everywhere on the site. Yeah, video and uh, uh, content, it needs to be something that editors can be able to bring all of these things in a very fast paced and efficient way. The editors have to be able to knock down the wall between the fan uh, and the game and, and get the content to them as quickly as possible. And serving something like basketball, the site has to be fast. Uh, from uh, editorial performance to front-end performance and server-side Drupal performance, everything has to get there as quickly as possible. So there's a lot of different pieces that make up NBA.com. There's live scores, there's game and da uh, team data, there's editorial content, there's video, uh, and th those are crucial things to, to the website. Um, there are some services that are just going to handle these things better than Drupal can, like live scoring, uh, video processing. Uh, plus, that's just kind of where it lives. Uh, that's where some of this stuff originates. Uh, a lot of this stuff gets reused and syndicated through other Turner systems. Uh, so it's important that those things continue to live where they've always lived because that's where other systems are going to need it besides Drupal. But the nice thing is Drupal 8 uh, specifically uh, plays really, really nicely uh, as a multi-tiered content stack. Uh, it, it works really well in the content ecosystem. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to be managed in Drupal. Uh, it can play well with others. Uh, it's a good team player. It's, it was one, of the, was one of the themes of Drupal 8 was that getting off of the Drupal island when we try to integrate with Symfony, trying to incorporate other things. And so that's just one of the things that Drupal 8 does really well. So we try to let Drupal play to its strengths. Uh, so all this is designed to seamlessly bring the game closer to the fan, regardless of where the content originates or lives, which we're going to show uh, through the rest of this presentation. So... Yeah, so one of the initial thoughts was, you know, we're going to do decoupled or headless Drupal. Um, we knew we were going to have to rely heavily on Drupal-themed components, though, uh, so it made sense to let Drupal take at least some of the theme work, uh, you know, just as much of the site as it knew about anyway. Uh, in most cases, uh, Drupal is going to be responsible for rendering about 60 or 70 percent of any given page on the site. And so you see in this slide... Uh, it's kind of color-coded to where maybe some of content is going to originate from. Um, so the, the render stack basically looks like this. Drupal renders the, the, the content on the page that it knows about. Uh, it renders this in origin. Uh, then the page travels through the CDN. Uh, the CDN is going to be responsible for merging edge site include fragments on the edge uh, and hand that on in a, in a very efficient manner. Uh, and, then, and then live content, uh, other external content, other external data is going to be assembled into the page, um, you know, using Angular, uh, Angular 2 apps. Uh, also, you want to keep in mind the fact that PHP is essentially single-threaded, so the use of ESI and Angular 2 to help let us assemble these things uh, lets us do so in a, in a very effectively, uh, in, in a very effective manner. Um, we're able to use multi-threading, essentially. Uh, since PHP is responsible maybe for building some of these other fragments at different times, uh, we're able to offload a lot of that out of the initial thread. All right, and we started developing uh, Drupal got, dot com, uh, or <laughs> Drupal com, MBA com on Drupal 8 in late 2015, early 2016, and none of the technologies we wanted to use were actually done. 
so um, the, the theme of this slide is uh, pretty much nothing between us and abject failure because uh, Drupal wasn't even in alpha yet when we got started. PHP 7 was not quite out of the gate. Uh, Angular 2 was in alpha and had some big breaking changes after that. Um, and AWS wasn't playing great with Docker yet at the time. Um, and the modules for Redis and some other things weren't uh, ready for Drupal yet either at the time. Um, so it was very, very interesting world developing while all of the technologies we were building on were also being developed. Yeah. So <clears throat> with all of these technologies, now that, now that we've got these in place, we've kind of worked through the kinks of getting these things to, to work together. Uh, that let us focus on, on the editorial experience and the content management aspects of building NBA.com. So that way we were able to bring a, a, a finely curated game experience to the fan. <clears throat> So it's important to note that we didn't want to limit ourselves to just the traditional page, right, with air quotes. Uh, so much of that is, is, you know, so much of what's on NBA is, is fluid uh, in that what Drupal renders initially and what the final page is that fans receive are not going to be the same thing. Uh, there's going to be continue enhan continuing enhancements to that page along the stack uh, for, for rendering that content. Uh, so the site's not made up of, you know, a traditional set of node pages and views and terms. Uh, literally anything should be able to be placed anywhere that makes sense on the site, uh, given the context of what the fan is looking at at that given time, regardless of where it comes from. Uh, and, th and that really is, the, the, in keeping with the theme, that, that nothing should be standing between the fan and getting to the content, no matter where it comes from. So to do this, one of the things that was, uh, one of the tools that was in our arsenal uh, is that, you know, we made heavy use of the paragraphs module. Um, in a lot of ways, this frees up the editors from having to think about things like templates and layout and being constrained to those, you know, very limiting uh, concepts in a lot of ways. Uh, it gives them a lot of power to add whatever piece of content makes sense at the time. So paragraphs leads to componentized content uh, these components then let us render uh, pieces of content either directly into the page uh, or to reuse later as ESI fragments. So now each piece of content can be rendered at the appropriate point in the page assembly, whether it's you know, Drupal rendering the page or ESI tacking that on later, uh, you know, pulling things in with JavaScript fragments. Uh, so there's, a, there's very much this, this modular layout concept uh, that you can mix and match content at will based on how content uh, relates to each other. So the next big concept that we um, had to come up with for MBA.com was our content <coughs> collections. Uh, our editors work very, very fast to keep up with the games, and they can't meticulously go through and curate every collection of content they want, but they don't want to lose the power to do so. So we developed the content collections, which kind of combines the functionality of a node queue and views. The editors are able to select a number of, or n number of content items they want pinned to the top of a collection. And then, which is kind of the node queue type part. And then the views type functionality, they're then able below that to say, and I also want to load anything that's tagged with these four taxonomy terms, but maybe there's a sponsored section of content they don't want to include, and they can actually exclude other content or other taxonomy terms as well. So they're able to get really fine grained control but still have the content show up as it's published and not have to be manually uh, hand-holding a node queue. Um, yeah, and then video, of course, is very important. And this is one of those places where we had to have Drupal be a good neighbor to other systems. Uh, Turner Broadcasting is 
uh, at its core, a broadcast company. We handle video, we handle lots of it. We have existing systems that handle video. So our challenge here was to make sure that Drupal can hold on to some of the metadata about video and make the Drupal ecosystem aware that a video exists but play nice with that being uh, handled with our outside encoding systems and storage on our high availability CDNs. Uh, because honestly, the scale of video that we're serving out, Drupal would fall over if it had to handle all of it. <laughs> you want to talk about League Pass integration? Or? Um, Let's see, League Pass integration. Uh, just, just a, I forgot what we were going to say about that. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> so so there there are several types of videos that that, that come into plays. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of video clips. I mean, man, did you see that? You know, did you see that that foul last night? That was terrible. You know, it was just that that kind of thing. That's the thing that fans want to see. Um, all the way to watching uh, watching live games. Uh, this was actually last night's game uh, in Mosaic View when you can watch. The game, uh, you can keep the camera on the leader for each player, uh, for each team, uh, and, and get, you know, even the, the, the goal shot, right? So you can, you can watch video in a lot of different, different ways, uh, all the way to League Pass, which uh, is a pay service uh, that, that NPA provides. Uh, I think there's some, some television cable entitlements involved. And so all of that integrates to let the fan truly get immersed in video. Uh, in keeping with you know, having nothing between the fan and the game. Yeah. Uh, so in order to bring all of this content to the fan, uh, one of the most important things is, is the editorial experience. So basketball games are fast moving and the, the face of the game can change in a split second. So just as live games can change momentum, the editorial staff has to kind of keep pace uh, just as fast, right? And so really nothing should stand between the editors and bringing the game to the fans. So to that point, we dedicated a pretty serious chunk of manpower to the editorial experience itself, uh, not just to the front, the, the fan facing website, but, but to the editorial experience. And so we, we had, we even had developers sitting in a control room uh, at Turner during, the t you know, during launch, uh, where as, as these games are going on and, and as things are occurring, you know, we're able to, to react to things in real time uh, to help make improvements on the fly. So in many ways, the editorial UX was just as key to the project as the website itself. So you know, editorial experience, is, it's, it's, it's so important that we're still making continuous improvements uh, just as we keep adding more features to the website. Um, so, so you know, one of the one of the key things that we, that we use uh, for the editorial experience, of course, is the use of paragraphs for layout. So, paragraphs, you know, I don't know if how many people are actually familiar with the paragraphs module and use it for uh, a lot of content layout, uh, but it's pretty powerful. So, it, it's essentially you can think of it as a container of fielded data uh, that lets editors pick from a variety of content types uh, that they can swap in and out on a page. So yeah, this is one of those things that, you know, you have a lot of field of data, uh, you know, and lets you, based on the context of the page you're trying to build, you can arrange things um, on a, on a one-off basis. Because editors really shouldn't care what an entity's type is. They just want it, and they want to be able to drop it in quickly. So paragraphs lets you drop content in. Uh, you can nest paragraphs if you want. Uh, you can drag and move things around. Uh, but essentially, it just lets uh, editors have that content at their fingertips. Uh, we even used a lot of paragraph fields for configuration, so each individual block on the website, for instance, you know, can have uh, a lot of tweaks made for it, letting them uh, you know, rapidly adapt to the content's needs. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, why no panels? Well, it's quite simply, it's just because it wasn't ready in early 2016 for what we wanted to do, mm -hmm. but beyond that, uh, the editorial staff wanted a very simple and minimal UI. Uh, they, they, they desired speed over power uh, because that was, yeah. that's, that's just kind of the ultimate thing that the editorial staff needs. Uh, so, you know, in, in keeping with uh, this fast pace, right, editors need media at their fingertips. And so we, we developed a couple of things uh, that were, were really powerful tools. Uh, one of which was the content bin, uh, which we'll, we'll see in a second. 
um, and the ability to embed media and syndicate content. So in this screenshot, what you see here is just a typical node edit page. Um, we have a content bin. Uh, it's a drawer that slides in and out, uh, just using a little bit of JavaScript. Uh, but what in that content bin, um, it uses views um, in, in, uh, to be able to search for different media entities and, and other pieces of content. So just using a, a little bit of custom theme magic, uh, we're able to kind of show and hide the content bin on any node edit form. Uh, and then just using super simple drag and drop API HTML5 markup, uh, we're able to make those media entities draggable out of the content bin and directly into the WYSIWYG. So uh, there's no custom uh, WYSIWYG plugins. There's nothing really that all that fancy. It's ju it just kind of worked uh, because of the drag and drop API. Um, and then uh, we make use of uh, the embed module. Um, the embed module uh, and the embed entities module uh, both will let you embed uh, any sort of entity on the website, whether it's another node, um, a media file, uh, or whatever. Uh, and it keeps those things as fielded data so that even though you're embedding things directly into the WYSIWYG, it's completely parsable. Uh, it's not just dropping a bunch of markup in there. So you're able to, an editor is able to find what they want, drag it into the WYSIWYG, and, and go. Um, what's more is the content bin has another tab to let you search for content upstream. It doesn't necessarily have to live in Drupal. So one of the things we did was the same content bin can now allow an editor to search for content in an external media management system, uh, something that you know, Im, you know Im, imports from like what Getty Images. Yeah, Getty is a really good example. Uh huh. So uh, you know a lot of like a lot of upstream uh, syndication systems. Uh, let you, you know, so you can, you can search uh, based on keywords and, and, a, and a few other things. Um, so you, you get a paginated overlay that lets you choose which image or images to import. Uh, when you import these, the, they're made immediately available in Drupal. So when you, when you select this awesome dunk, you import it, it's going to be at the top of your content bin right away. Um, the nice thing is because of, of the system, uh, the editors never actually lose their place. So it's not like they're having to go and fetch something else in another page and then have to come back and save changes. It's all, it's all happening right there in the interface. Uh, so these media items, they get pulled in as just regular media file entities uh, directly in Drupal. So that, that way, the next time you need it on another story, it's already in Drupal in the content bin. All right. Uh, so we also started um, very early on with Angular 2. Uh, game pages in particular need a lot of data from a lot of places and it doesn't make sense to grab live game data that's stored in an external system, pipe it through Drupal on every page load and push it out to the user that's going to take us forever. Uh, so we went back and forth with a bunch of um, front end frameworks, uh, ended up settling on Angular 2. Um, which we briefly re regretted early on um, until they got to uh, release candidate six, which uh, fixed all of the problems that we had been talking with the Angular team about. Um, mostly that it was early on uh, pretty much uh, monolithic, single page app focused. Um, but it just did a really good job of being able to pull content from our structured data systems for live data, being able to get updated content from Drupal, um, being able to go out to our other media systems to grab video content, it uh, just worked really well for us. And then the Redux model of data storage. We yeah. may both need to talk a little bit on this one. Um, so, so one of the one of the things that you you run into anytime you're dealing with uh, live data, especially you know client side assembly, fetching live data can be very taxing. So until a score changes, there's no need to keep requesting the same data over and over again just because a, a user's clicked through to another game, right? So the the data that you you pull in uh, using Angular uh, gets gets put into a, a local data store. This data store is going to travel with you throughout the site. So. Angular stores this data in local storage. It carries it across multiple pages. Uh, it also shares the same data with other Angular apps. So if, if, you're on a, if you're on the home page, for instance, 
Uh, it's going to load up the entire schedule of games for that day along with any scoring data that it knows about. Then when you go to a game, uh, you know, you, you go to the Thunder game uh, and you want to watch that video, the same data is carried over uh, for that, that game schedule information as well as the scoring information. And so if you have multiple apps on the side or even multiple apps on the same page, they're all sharing the same bit of data. So there's no need to go and fetch it every single time. Also, when one app says, hey, the, the score's changed, let me update the score, then it's immediately available to all, any other Angular app on the page. Uh, so that's just you know, one more way that this kind of keeps the fan closer to the, to the live game experience and allows them to seamlessly track games. Okay. See, I think we've uh, mostly covered on it here, but here's just an example of where uh, the Redux model comes into play. Uh, if you look at the uh, left-hand side of that screenshot, this is a game page playing a live game. And when the user came into this page, the schedule was able to render very quickly on this new page load because all the data to build it was already in the local data store. We didn't have to make any additional uh, API or data calls uh, because the page already had the information it needed. And that also means that when you have that uh, brief flash of out-of-date data on a new rendering, that it's a couple seconds old instead of however old the cached version of your page on the server is. Yeah. Okay, so this actually gets into the part where I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit more. Um, Early on, we, we started on this before Drupal started the whole API first initiative. And early Drupal 8 didn't have a whole lot available uh, when it came to powerful APIs. So, and we also decided we didn't want SQL queries getting between the fan and the game um, in generating our content. So we have set it up so that uh, we actually denormalize all of our data as it's updated and push it into an Elasticsearch instance, which is the backing store for our content API. This allows us to build as many different microservices as we want and need for various types of APIs. Uh, we have a standard JSON output content API that we built and actually have already created our version API, uh, version two API, which sits alongside it. And this has also allowed other teams uh, within our development group to spin up a Facebook instant articles service in Node.js, an Apple News uh, service, and a Google AMP service, all without bloating our Drupal code base and all of these things can depend on the denormalized data structure in Elasticsearch and get very fast results. And because Drupal is updating the data in Elasticsearch every time there's a change, it stays up to date. All right, and then the cloud. We actually, this is, was our first foray into hosting anything in AWS and our first foray into Docker. Um, and previously within Turner, we were very siloed and we had a database group. We have server ops. We have um, other operations teams. We've got a few people that uh, used to be siloed for that in here, James. <laughs> Um, but we've moved more towards a DevOps uh, infrastructure and workflow, and going into Docker and AWS has really allowed us to become the masters of our own destiny and respond quickly and really tune the infrastructure of the site and be able to develop both the infrastructure and the code to work with each other. And so 
uh, let's see, Docker, it allows us to run the same Drupal infrastructure with the same version of Linux, the same version of PHP, the same version of Nginx, everything on the local development stack as we're running in production. We don't have to worry about a developer's NPM version being older or newer than the one we have in prod. And it really allows us to miss some of those, or not even have to think about some of those version mismatches you get when you, you're doing local development in a more traditional sense. Uh, also allows us to control our compute density and spin up or down as many or few containers as we need to serve the traffic that we're getting. Docker also makes continuous integration very easy. Um, and we use Docker Compose to build our local environments, which is helpful. Um, we don't have too much time to go into the intricacies of serving Drupal on AWS. Uh, probably deserves its own complete session, which I was actually a little um, saddened that none of, that there actually weren't any uh, Drupal and AWS uh, sessions this year. Maybe but if any, uh, maybe next year. But if anybody is interested in uh, sharing thoughts, you can come up to us afterwards. Um, and if there's enough interest, maybe we can uh, get together and put, a, put together a bot. <laughs> All right, and another thing, everything about this has been making things fast. We want to serve our content fast, we want to edit our content fast, and we want users getting to the game fast. So, so yeah, oftentimes uh, that, that means you have to develop fast too. Um, you know, there's a tentpole event coming up, there's, there's some, some thing has broken and you, you, you gotta get things up fast. So just as kind of a, a bonus slide, we wanted to talk, you know, uh, really quickly about uh, uh, our Git branching strategies uh, that we used to, to help us do a lot of fast-paced development, not lose track of where we are, uh, not introduce a lot of things into, into production that we don't want. So because of the fast pace of development and the need to keep our mainline branches pure and, and as free as, of untested or unapproved changes as possible, uh, we used what we, what we dubbed uh, continue flow. Uh, it's kind of a derivation of Wonderflow as our Git branching strategies. And so if you're familiar with things like, uh, like Git flow, for instance, we threw that out because uh, that just wasn't going to cut it for, for what we needed. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a very widely distributed team um, and, and things you know, move very quickly. Um, and, and so things like uh, tentpole events, you know, like the all-star game, for instance, uh, it's a very good use case uh, because you have development going on. You know, one developer may be doing a couple of bug fixes here and there and some feature enhancements, uh, but it all the while also working on some parallel work in a, in a separate epic branch, essentially, uh, that may last for several months. And so the ability to get things out in integration testing without interfering with the rest of development is, is, is really critical. So the, the analogy we, we try to use uh, very frequently is that if you have an integration mainline branch, uh, a staging or a QA mainline branch, and a production mainline branch. These things never never intersect. They're, they're running in parallel. And as a developer works on a particular feature, uh, they, they pull it in for master, they do a whole lot of work, they make things better, uh, and they, they'll merge that into integration uh, first so that they, that's up on the integration server. Uh, you're able to test it. Someone says, oh, no, 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 look, look, that creates a regression with this other feature here. You have to, you know, instead of having to worry about pulling that back out, because, you know, if you think about it, once you dump something into the river, trying to get it back out is tough. Let's, let's face it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's okay. You can let that go in the integration environment because that's a, that's a transient mainline branch anyway. Uh, but once you get it working in integration and you're happy with it, then you move it on to you merge the same feature branch back into uh, the QA branch. The QA branch then is what the QA team is actually doing all of their testing with. There's a combination of automated and manual testing that occurs there, and everything that's there is assumed to be ready for production. Once QA is signed off on it, then that feature branch is merged a third and final time into uh, the, the master branch, into the production branch. Uh, at that point, then it's ready for production, 
and you can absolutely trust that anything that's in master uh, doesn't need to be reevaluated for any kind of further QA. It's ready to go. Mm -hmm. Now the key thing to this is that you never merge a mainline branch into your feature branch other than master, right? So in Git flow, oftentimes the process is, you know, you create a branch from develop, you make some changes, you try to merge it back in through a pull request and you get a merge conflict, that big yellow exclamation point that just <laughs> ruins your day. And, and so a lot of times the, the, the fix is real simple, right? You just merge, develop back into your feature branch, uh, resolve the merge conflict locally and push it back up. Well, the problem is you've now introduced a whole lot of unknown changes to your feature branch. So that feature branch couldn't go into QA or stage. Yeah. So we, we worked out a lot of other ways to resolve merge conflicts that keeps things very unidirectional. All right, um, and I, I don't know if there's a, a lot of other performance geeks in the room. Um, I personally uh, stay up, up uh, awake at night uh, thinking about not only milliseconds, but nanoseconds. Um, so some things that we uh, discovered to help make Drupal 8 faster. Number one, run PHP 7, and make sure you turn opcache on. Uh, opcache, um, even though the underlying uh, performance of PHP 7 is greatly improved and there's some opcache like things uh, built into the core of PHP 7. In practice, opcache still about doubles the performance of PHP 7. Uh, another, another key thing is, is get cache, get, tr get temporary and transient data out of SQL. If it's not content, if it's not config, you don't want it in there. Um, there's no need to have um, you know, anonymous page requests, you know, essentially writing to the database. Uh, so, so get that out of, out of SQL as much as possible. Yep. Uh, also, you want to right size your caching. Uh, my best example of this is if you've got a block that lists related content and you've got maybe five different uh, derivatives of that block for five different main content sections, and you've got about a hundred pieces of content in each of those. Uh, if you just um, use the defaults and let your cache context be the URL, you're going to be rendering and caching 500 separate copies of something that you only really have five different um, varieties of. So it's very important that uh, as you're getting into tuning your performance, learn how to create your own cache contexts, learn how to create your own cache keys, and when your cache keys should be cleared as the related content changes, and you're going to save yourself a lot of time in the page rendering. Yeah. Speaking of, speaking of page rendering, uh, just in time or, or uh, you know, assembling content where it's appropriate uh, is, is really crucial too. So, you know, let, let Drupal render the things that it knows about. Don't let Drupal spend a whole lot of time worrying about things that live outside of Drupal. Uh, you, can use, uh, you can use Akamai or, or, or Varnish or uh, any number of CDNs that support edge side includes to pull things in for you that assemble on the edge. It's going to be much faster than letting Drupal go and fetch those things and, and try to merge it into the page. Uh, it also eliminates a lot of cache issues um, when, you, when you use edge side includes because you can serve a cached page from Drupal and then conditionally add content based on user preferences, geolocation, uh, and that sort of thing uh, to a cached page. So Drupal is just serving the cached page. ESI adds things conditionally, um, you know, and then delivers that to the user, which then, of course, you know, Angular and, and, and other JavaScript uh, magic will, will finish the page for you. It adds the polish. Um, horizontal da database scaling is also something that we've put a lot of work into. Uh, that in and of itself isn't necessarily a uh, performance booster. You can also scale vertically, uh, but especially if you're moving into the cloud, vertically scaling your databases gets very, very expensive. Uh, before we started working on horizontal database scaling, um, I think about 75% of what we were spending in AWS was just on a really, really big uh, AuroraDB instance. Uh, and so 
Unfortunately, horizontal database scaling is easier said than done in Drupal 8. Um, we had to do a lot of work, as Toby mentioned earlier, to get the all the transient data out of SQL so that our web containers, which we'll talk about the splitting of containers in a minute, but so that the uh, public traffic isn't trying to write to the database, which allows us to take those containers that are serving to the public and just point them to a read-only database and uh, Amazon's Aurora DB uh, gives us a an endpoint that will automatically scale across read replicas, uh, which makes things very nice there. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and talk about the role separation as well. Um, we we also wanted to fire kind of firewall the different tasks that Drupal does, so that if the editors are doing something really heavy, we got couple dozen editors in there, fast and furious, adding new content, adding new videos, that they're not taking up all of our compute space from the fans that are trying to get to the new content for the game. Um, and I don't know if you've ever dealt with um, cron tasks in Drupal. Drupal cron can get really heavy, so we actually separated out a third role of a utility container that will run all of the Drupal cron tasks. That's where we will put out API endpoints for other internal systems to push content into Drupal. Uh, and anything automated and back -endy that doesn't actually uh, interact with users, we put on that separate thing so that we're not bogging, again, not bogging down the compute that is serving the fan with automated tasks that they don't care about. You know, in an earlier one we were talking about um, uh, getting cache and, and other data out of the database, um, trying to horizontally scale. One of the things that really helped was we actually even moved uh, PHP sessions out of the database uh, in, into Redis. Um, and that was, that was, uh, that was a, a particularly interesting lift and we learned a lot about mm -hmm. service decoration, um, that, that probably alone deserves another session. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so, so once we were able to move uh, PHP sessions out of the database, because even anonymous users still can potentially trigger a session that gets written to the database, that was sort of the last key piece to being able to put the database into read-only mode. So most of what you see on NBA.com is actually getting served from a, a read-only uh, database. Um, another interesting point is the, uh, the Redis sessions module that we did uh, could potentially let you extend to using other PHP um, session, man, uh, session handling systems uh, using a lot of the built-in Symfony uh, native session handler uh, plugins. So you could use uh, the stock PHP session management again. You can use file systems. You can use uh, MongoDB. You could use uh, Memcache. Uh, all of these things based on uh, service declarations and in, in using the, the Redis sessions module as sort of a template. Mm -hmm. I've actually been talking to uh, Sasha Berdier, um, as most people are going to know him, uh, who maintains the Redis module about uh, helping with uh, maintaining the Redis module um, as a result of some of this work that we've been doing um, and contributing back the Redis sessions module as a drop-in replacement for uh, session handling in Drupal. Um, the other nice thing is, is it does keep all of the optimizations that Drupal has made over the, the last couple of major versions, uh, including session migration, uh, session deletion, uh, preventing anonymous users from creating sessions that get saved and so on. So that sort of thing is, is, is something that it is quite literally just a drop in. You enable the module and you're immediately uh, using um, sessions uh, out of Redis. All right, and here we've got a, a nice little graph of some uh, performance changes that have happened over time on site. Um, ignore the big green blob at the beginning. That was um, kind of happening as we were importing all of our data from our legacy CMS, blowing it all away, importing again, blowing it away, importing again. Um, but the first really interesting thing is after the big green blob falls off. Um, and we go up that one little spike and then back down. There were a few performance 
uh, some, there was some bad performing code that got put out and then fixed. Um, and then you see that third little spike there. Uh, that's actually when we went live and went from an average of you know, 50 to 100 requests a minute from all of our QA testing up to, uh, depending on the time of day, anywhere between two and 6,000 requests per second that make it through to our origin um, after all of our um, Akamai offload. Um, so we were actually very pleasantly surprised that we got just about a 25% uh, bump in our response time there. Uh, things kind of go along. We, we weren't very happy with our performance there. We made a few tweaks, uh, and we actually upsized that first fall off. We upsized our database and started spending way too much money on Aurora DB. Um, and then you go along, and that first drop before the end of daylight savings time, we turned on OpCache, thanks to... Uh, James over there, and also made our first set of pulling uh, things that Drupal doesn't uh, easily and automatically move out of the database when you turn on a Redis module or a memcache module. Um, and that got us down to about 250 milliseconds, and uh, through various code releases that maybe released something that wasn't very well optimized and re-optimizing. Uh, we've hovered around 250 milliseconds uh, since then, um, but we've got another round of improvements coming soon uh, for the l just a few more tweaks that should hopefully be pulling us down to um, consistently staying right about 150 milliseconds on a response, which makes me very happy. Um, so as Toby mentioned, um, we wanted to get our cache out of SQL, and uh, we learned that SQL is not the best place to store a cache. Um, and about halfway through our optimizations, uh, we were looking at uh, New Relic. If you don't have it, get it or another uh, high performance uh, profiling application and service, it will save your life because uh, you don't know what to fix unless you uh, know what's happening in production. There's gonna be problems in production that will never occur on your other environments just because of the scale of traffic you're getting and it really changes the landscape. But about halfway through optimizations, uh, we saw that the most time we were spending talking to SQL was that the dependency injection container queries were taking more time than looking up nodes, uh, running views, loading the home page, anything. Um, and thanks to a document we found on uh, platform.sh's website, so thanks to you guys if there's any of you in the room. Uh, we were able to uh, take the dependency injection container and move it uh, into the chained fast backend, which means that about 99.9 .9 and several more 9% of the time, it's being served from local memory. And so there's no network requests that have to be made, and it gets that dependency injection container very fast. Um, and then it will also use Redis now for consistency of that container. If it doesn't have it, it'll go grab it from Redis and put it back into uh, local memory. Um, not gonna really go into this in detail. We just really included uh, a sample configuration for Redis in here so that if anybody wants to see how to set it up, you can go download the slides uh, probably by tomorrow. Um, and have something to get started with for getting all of those uh, caching pieces and transient data out of SQL in, into something that uh, works a little bit better for that. Yeah, we also promise we're gonna try to blog more about this kind yes. of stuff. Yes. <laughs> all right, uh, so does anybody have any uh, questions? Uh, if, if there's a microphone right here in the yes. middle of the 
the, the auditorium and the, and the room that, that'll help with uh, getting those questions recorded for posterity. So when a bug comes out or a new feature happens, um, obviously sometimes you might need to clear the cache. And with so many different layers of caching, what is your, I guess, cache clearing strategy when you have that many hits all the time? Um, so our strategy is we clear cache as little as possible and try to only clear the cache that needs clearing. Uh, that can present some challenges. Um, if you are needing to clear some of your code caches or your CSS or your JavaScript cache, uh, one thing we do is uh, each build, we take a hash of all of our code and pop it into a uh, setting in the database so that we can check it. And we, d during our post deploy, we will uh, compare the previous hash and the current hash to see if any code has changed. If the code has changed, we clear all the code caches. Uh, we also make sure anytime we update the PHP in a module or update any CSS or JavaScript that's included via a library, that we update the versions of either the module or the libraries, and Drupal will automatically handle uh, clearing those caches for us. It'll put, um, it'll if you're serving the files individually, it'll put a, a little version decorator that will um, cache bust, uh, or it'll all again clear the uh, container injection and module list cache. Uh, if you're in other caches, it's kind of knowing your site. And if you're using uh, Drush or uh, Drupal console to clear caches, just learning which caches need to be cleared when. Uh, and as you get a better picture of that, automate as much of it as you can so that when something needs to be cleared on a build, you clear that cache on that build. Thanks. Hi, guys. Thanks for a great session. Um, we had a recently a project where we were a lot of developers, a lot of continuation in continuous deployment. How did you handle configuration management? Because we've been seeing a lot of issues where people didn't get updated configuration or overwrote stuff. Um, we use the, the features module, which um, is much more like uh, configuration management in Drupal 8 uh, than it is any previous uh, iteration of features. Uh, but that really helps us split the configuration management out into the modules that that configuration is appropriate to. Uh, now there is, at least in the version we have, I don't know if it's been uh, fixed since then, I haven't checked on if there's any updates lately. You do run a little bit of a risk of getting um, duplicate configuration between modules. So you got to keep an eye out for that and make sure that you're not uh, creating a the same YAML file in multiple places because it gets confused. Um, but that's really helped us keep that separate and reduce the collisions. Yeah, one one, one thing that we we've, we've also talked about uh, uh, there's a there's sort of a, an emerging best practice with using features in configuration management is that. For, for the course of development, uh, it's best to store all of your configuration for a particular feature in an exported features module. Uh, and that's, that's the same exact, um, you know, CMI uh, YAML files. It just, it, it keeps it there. But when you're getting ready to go from making the leap from your staging environment where you've QA'd everything and you're happy with, with everything, do a single pickup of the entire CMI and drop that into uh, production. And, and that's something that could be easily automated as well. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. that's, that's sort of the direction that we're going for here. And it's kind of an emerging best practice on a lot of other uh, feet. You know, like, you know, there's a, there's a blog post about, you know, using features and CMI and how they can kind of work together. And so you, you can do the, the, the fine tuning of configuration management using features. And then when you're happy with, with the entire site, then it's just a matter of picking up that and, and, and dropping it into production. Thanks. Great. Hey guys, thanks for all the good information. Uh, I have a question about strategy for setting metrics for your speed testing. So a couple of years ago, there was a study about Walmart and when they 
optimized speed on their site, they found that dropping the speed, I want to say it's two seconds, it might have been two milliseconds, it had a, a result of increased sales and increased cart uh, by just a ridiculous amount. So I was wondering if you guys had any metrics that you were looking at, bounce rate or uh, user uh, engagement or sales or anything like that. Um, we we do. I don't uh, have all of that uh, data ready in my head right now, but uh, we've definitely looked at how it affects um, the end user and been um, more so than even that, though, we just focus on what our worst behaviors are and uh, try to improve those. Okay, thanks. Hey guys, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm curious a little to hear a little bit more about your kind of ESI strategy, uh, and maybe I have a couple questions. Maybe what kind of cash offload from Origin you've been able to achieve, uh, and if there have been any concerns about maybe the ways you've used ESI uh, leading to like vendor lock-in, having to use a certain CDN. Um, let's see. I'll actually address the vendor lock-in uh, piece first. Um, Changing vendors is always painful. Um, once you've chosen a vendor, if you're going to take advantage of the reasons you chose that vendor, then you're going to get vendor lock-in. Um, and being a, you don't want to do fear-driven development. That's a mistake that our group has made a lot in the past. And we've suffered severe limitations because we were afraid to take advantage of the technology we had at our fingertips, because what if we wanted to change? Um, so that's my take on that. Um, and as far as the uh, ESI, we're, um, we it's very similar to the way that you would do something if you want an Angular app in your page. You, you take a block or whatever other piece of content, uh, you create a, an endpoint or a route in Drupal that will serve the HTML that you want to go in that place. And then when you're rendering a page, your template for that thing is just the code for the ESI include that Akamai or Varnish or whatever other service would come back to Drupal and get. Mm -hmm. Uh, one, one, one way to, to think about it is if you were to take a block, um, add a bunch of fields to it for configuration, you know, some sort of like set of settings for that block, uh, then place the block on the page, um, you, could, you could designate for every country code, for instance, uh, use this separate fragment. And so we do a lot of geocoding mm -hmm. because NBA yeah. is, is, is worldwide, and so we want to be able to show different content to different countries uh, based on where you're at. So if you're in Canada, for instance, uh, you might get um, a, a block at the top of the page that's dedicated to content about, you know, Canadian players or, or something that might be of more interest. Um, so you can use blocks to use sort of the, like you can manage which fragments are going to get displayed uh, all in the UI. So you don't have to do a whole lot of, you know, code tweaks later um, as you, you know, deploy to other countries and you start creating, you know, content for other countries. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you can just manipulate that in, in that block configuration. Uh, and then the template for that block is essentially just yeah. pulling together the ESI uh, include, the, the, the edge side include, fr you know, with the appropriate fragment from your configuration. Uh, and it's all conditional based on uh, the geo-targeting uh, ESI code. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the talk. I uh, have two questions. First one, I'm curious, um, what made you choose uh, Angular 2 over the other front-end frameworks? Um, I mean, in the end, we, we did a lot of comparison. Uh, we were kind of hanging uh, right on balance between Angular and React. And we were coming up on the deadline where we had to choose and had to start uh, developing and just kind of on gut went with Angular. Yeah. Um, early, early on, there was there was sort of a uh, there was sort of a I don't know game is the right word, but it was basically 
find an Angular developer, make them write something in React, and find a React developer and make them write something in Angular too. And depending on how well they were able to pick up the nuances of the new language, that was going to help influence. Mm -hmm. and, and because Angular 2 was a little bit easier to pick up, uh, because it has some things from Angular, but a lot of concepts from React, uh, it, it was it was one of those things that was kind of the, the, the push over the edge a little yeah. bit. To, to I, I had actually to. forgotten we did the Bake Off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, uh, it also helps um, to note that we actually did spend a little bit of time talking with some of the Google developers of Angular 2, mm -hmm. uh, and you'll find that Angular 4, which is out now, uh, has baked in a lot of the things that, that we ran into, and they used that to kind of fine tune the development of Angular 4. We found out recently. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And second one, do you guys use preview? Um, so, like preview of, of node content? Node content, yeah. I'm just um, curious if you had any issues uh, working with preview and microservices and front end framework. Um, yeah, we, we had a number of issues with yeah. preview. That was uh, that was one of the things that we we, we spent a lot of time early on um, trying to get you know like like the preview of a of an article page for instance, uh, right? So editors are working fast paced. They don't want to save it yet, um, so they will uh, want to preview that. So we actually we had a lot of trouble getting preview to work um, with all of these other pieces. Um, there were just a lot of things that were, were interfering. We could probably revisit it now since yeah. we you know resolved a lot of other issues. Uh, but one of the one of the things to to preview was that we actually use uh, a little bit of like workbench moderation to have editorial workflow. So uh, an editor will make a change and it'll actually save it as a draft, and then they can just view the draft. Yeah. Uh, so that way they're getting a much more live representation yeah. of that page. Um, and just a, another note on preview from our journey, uh, not only on MBA.com but also uh, work we've done with preview on the MBA team sites. Find out what level of preview your editors need. Um, sometimes not even what they want, but what they need. Because the more you have to preview, you almost end up with a hockey stick graph of effort. Um, when you start having to preview the home page with all of the articles that are saved in a draft state, <laughs> Uh, it can become quite a mess and a whole nother level of content management just to manage your previews. So the simpler you can keep your preview um, where it still meets your editor's needs is very important. Thanks a lot. So this is going to be a kind of a vague and broad question, but what were some of the, the big aha moments you guys had while developing the site where the light bulb went off and the clouds parted and just something something major happened for you, something clicked? A lot of those. Yeah, um, one of the <laughs> biggest ones that popped into my head is cache contexts. Um, they're, they're, again, there's a few out of the box and they, they seem they're the ones that you always need, uh, but they're very broad, and writing your own can make a giant difference uh, in not only the performance of your site, but when your content becomes available. Because if they're too narrow, stuff doesn't get updated. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the biggest ones. Um, another one is listen to your editorial staff. Yeah. Uh, let them dictate what they're, because th think of your editorial staff as a consumer of your product, right? Mm -hmm. So getting prototyped code in front of in, in the hands of, of an editor is going to let you fail early, you know, fail fast. Um, they're going to they're know that you know, oh, this 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 thing is great. You can drag and drop all this stuff. Man, that's really slow. It's not. It's it's a little bit sluggish. I want to shave like a millisecond off of that time, you know. And so so you know, iterating with your editorial staff is as mm -hmm. quickly as possible. Yeah. I think is is really key. Um, in a previous life, I actually worked in a newsroom. You know, I, I was looking at journalism, and I got into uh, web development and then Drupal development, working with newspapers and other editorial staff. Editors think completely different than developers, <laughs> and so yep. working with them one on one, getting their feedback is it, that was a, that was a yeah. really key moment, uh, and, and that really changed the game for us in a lot of ways with yeah. how we built the admin interface. Yeah. One one quick follow up question. 
What is one incident that would show up on the NBA.com development blooper reel? Uh, ooh, one? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was surprisingly smooth given the, the yeah. effort. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I, I mean, obviously, you know, opcash was a was yeah. A, that that, that was know, a big the, one. Some, some choice words I think were had when that was discovered. <laughs> um, I, I think I think another one you know along the lines of caching was um, storing uh, user specific cache in between pages uh, instead of static cache, for instance. Hmm. Um, you know when you should be using static cache. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it causes a lot of issues if you have multiple administrators logged in as the same user. Uh, suddenly you start getting a lot of cache collision because it's trying to uh, share that in the database. So if you use, you know, Drupal static cache, for instance, uh, it, it can make your life a lot easier. That was another uh, thing we found yeah. as a performance issue. Hmm. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, my question circles around, you talked about using local cache for some of the displays, and I was wondering, what was your strategy for uh, updating these? Because uh, you showed an example of the live uh, event page. So I'm thinking, look, when the scale changes, this is supposed to change in real time. So what what was the strategy for that? Um, are you talking about the, the strategy for updating live scores? Yeah, what, what, how were you updating the live scores in the local cache? Were you pushing uh, it out? Uh, or? Um, yeah, so in, in Angular 2, uh, you'd, we'd develop services for each data source. And um, between the services and our Angular components, they're aware of kind of how time sensitive that date, that particular piece of data is. So uh, something like the um, entire schedule for the season, we're not going to be updating that every 10 seconds. We're not going to be looking at that feed on every page load. Um, I think we may look at it every 10, 15 minutes to pull a new copy in. But things like live scoring for the game that is live right now, uh, we go and check every few seconds. And it's really just in how you configure your services. Another, another good strategy for doing live scoring, too, is um, if you have a service that is capable of um, like establishing a WebSocket, then the, the browser can make a WebSocket connection, mm -hmm. and it keeps that connection open between you and the service. It's a little bit trickier if you're bouncing between page and page, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a really common strategy for live scoring, too, where you, uh, you keep a, a socket connection open, and during, during times of no transmission, then it's just, it's just open, but nothing's happening, so it's, it's a very low bandwidth thing. Uh, and then when the service, the, the scoring service sees that a new score has updated, uh, it's able to say, hey, everybody who's listening, broadcast mm -hmm. out the new, the new score. And so my browser then gets that ping from the open WebSocket that the live score is updated, updated in the page, and then update that score in the local data store. Uh, and then you can also use like a long pole effect. So you can, you know, if, if say after... 15 seconds, I haven't received anything from that WebSocket communication. Let me go double check and make a new request and reestablish the WebSocket. Mm -hmm. So those are some other strategies to, to live scoring as well. Okay. Yes, Thanks. And see, right. so yeah, we're uh, almost five minutes over time, so I think, we, uh, and we've run out of line, so I think that's a good time to cut off the questions. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and, uh, if you're interested, don't forget to check out Toby's other session at the uh, opposite end of today on uh, Dungeons and Dragons in Drupal. All right, cool. Good job, man.